Slavoj Žižek once said that um, all of this wokeness and cancel culture was a uh, one last uh, kind of bourgeois resistance to real political change. I think he said this like five or six years ago or something. So um, now uh, I think this is basically accurate, but. Um, it's never really been explored in what sense, in what sense it's the resistance and in what sense, like, how does it function? Because let's take this statement and let's go five years. I think this statement was, was said um, about five or six years ago. So let's let's skip forward and um, and think about has it has it has it as a resistance been successful? And I think so far, yes, like it's managed to to stop real political change. Um, uh, so it's worth thinking about how and why and what does it do. So I titled this video, The Swimming Imperative versus The Cancelling Imperative. Uh, and the, the swimming imperative will make sense at the end of the video, but the cancelling imperative, uh, this tendency for the uh, kind of intensification of social ostracization, um, social punishment, reputational sabotage, sometimes going as far as, as the uh, loss of employment. Um, but I would argue that it doesn't even need to go that far to, to function. I would think that that is sometimes just a, just a, um, a, a step which uh, occurs in extreme situations when there's people that are more kind of high profile people. There's a there's a um, uh, almost Foucauldian kind of system of punishment and conditioning, which has released itself um, as a reaction to the political instabilities of the 2000 and kind of uh, 2008 crash, and then the kind of political um, um, uh, political developments surrounding populism, which responded to that, and. Um, I think that that one way you could look at this is by comparing it to what happened a uh, hundred years ago, where you had this period of um, the late nineteenth century was a period of um, I say like a, a a increase in the amount of people within the middle class, and um, not just that, but certain kind of emphasis on scientific and economic progress and development which gave people a certain kind of expectation for how how history should go and then world war one happened and you have this massive intervention into those uh, you have an intrusion into those expectations and it, and it kind of upset the whole the whole uh, way we saw the future and i think that basically the same thing can be said in our time um, uh, in the sense that you have, uh, again, the late 20th century, this big expansion of middle class, you have an even further intensification of the kind of, uh, kind of scientific, scientific, uh, scientism and kind of a developmental optimism. Um, this time being, you know, uh, having infused into it the idea of a world, uh, liberal society, not just a Western one, but a, a world liberal society, um, on top of, you know, um, improvements in living standards and uh, uh, kind of liberal social mobility and, uh, you know, uh, uh, better houses, whatever, better education, better health care, all this stuff. You also have expectations around um, uh, like kind of techno utopian stuff like uh, technology is going to is going to save us from death and technology is going to. Um, is gonna uh, allow us to live forever. We can biogenetically, um, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> improve babies or something. You know, to make them better looking or more intelligent. All this kind of stuff. You you really have a kind of exaggeration of those um, uh, kind of progressive expectations. Um, and then again, two thousand and eight crash. COVID, the shift away from a unipolar to a multipolar world, um, all of this stuff has basically ruined those expectations. And 
a similar uh, political instability is being caused from it. Our era, although it's separated from a um, hundred years ago, insofar as that its capacity for uh, altering reality is a lot more is a lot more um, sophisticated. Advances in media technology and also advances in social engineering and advances in uh, you know uh, let's say kind of scientific expectations which can actually alter like our phenomenological reality of the world like pharmacology for example um, the input of pharmacology into a society um, from a political perspective from a biopolitical perspective has never really been looked at seriously um, what would have I, I think Fukuyama once asked the question like what would have happened to Napoleon if he could have just taken some um, antidepressants? <laughs> it's a really obvious, but really, it's a really ingenious question. It's like, would he have done? Like, would would history have been the same if you had if you had pharmacological um, uh, sort of uh, technologies that we have now back then? And you know, it's it's I don't know. It's 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 a great question. But just to return to this sort of uh, kind of Foucauldian question of punishment and conditioning, what is it exactly that we are punishing and we are conditioning out of? Because if Zizek once said that that it is a real political change, um, one could imagine that a real political change could also happen from this punishing itself. I mean, like, instead of getting the kind of a whatever sort of change that he would have hoped for or, or or imagined could happen back then um we have had a lot of change you know like the in the past few years uh covid the society during the lockdowns was extremely different you know um we have had a lot of change in a, in a in, in a direction which was largely unexpected and um probably not in line with uh, anyone's sort of progressive ideas of change, whether whether that be a liberal or whether that be a Marxist, and or whether that be Hegelian and and so on and so on. So um, it's not necessarily the case that we're not going to get change, but I think he that I think that this statement about wokeism being a resistance to something is still accurate. Um, but it's not necessarily that it's a resistance to change. I would say it's a resistance to the traditional capacity for, you know, um, kind of Marxism and Leninism to see crisis. And when I say crisis, I don't just mean random crisis, but I mean things which intrude into our understanding and our expectations of historical development. That's kind of specifically what I mean. This is specifically what we should what we should frame as crisis. Crisis isn't just because you know there's a tidal wave in somewhere, or an earthquake in somewhere, or you know, uh, or I don't know, like whatever. Uh, crisis historically and politically means specifically an intrusion into what we think the future is going to be like, into those in those mental investments, into our kind of psychopolitical understanding of the future. That's the real crisis. The, the random stuff, which is bad, but doesn't, but doesn't, doesn't intrude in this way. It's, it's just bad stuff that happens, and we adapt, right? This is a more specific definition of crisis. The thing which wokeism has been very good at is that it's punished, and scapegoated, and exiled, and withheld that kind of more traditional Marxist-Leninist capacity to say, okay, th there's an intrusion into the crisis in, insofar as there's an intrusion into the expectations of progress and the, the, um, the expectations of the future, but we're not going to, um, uh, sorry, but we're going to use th this intrusion to our benefit. We're going to actually become real historical and political subjects, not because of, oh, well, we've got more wealth or, oh, we've got more scientific development or, oh, we've got more education or, oh, we've got better healthcare. Quite the opposite. The, it's, it's the very intrusion into all of this stuff, which in a sense uh, facilitates the real historical becoming of a political subject. And in, in Marxian terms, that was the proletariat and the revolutionary subject and so on and so on and so on. 
to sound like Zizek, so on and so forth. But 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 even Zizek has has lost this very understanding of this kind of more radical under uh, this more radical um, politicizing of the crisis. Um, uh, he holds on to his understanding of how he expected the future to be, which includes how he expected the kind of uh, uh, political subversion of the system to be. And what he's gotten instead is something he didn't expect. What he ended up getting instead was like Trump and so on, and like and like these uh, kind of right wing, uh, so called right wing populist um, uh, forces, who have kind of become the creative force, who have become the creative voice. Uh, I'm not saying I agree with them and everything. I'm not saying we should agree with them and everything. I'm not saying we should. Uh, I'm just saying that like uh, things have have turned out in an unexpected way, and that has intruded. Our understanding of the political subject itself has intruded. Um, you know, so, so do I think right-wing populism, as it stands, is going to create some sort of great revolutionary change and challenge the kind of neoliberal technocratic system? No, I don't think it is, right? But, but um, it is inadequate and limited in many ways. But, but that's not really the point. The point is that our understanding of... Uh, the future, which included our understanding of the revolutionary subject or the political subject, has altered in a way which people, not only the kind of establishment people, but also the, the so-called subversive people, the, the radicals and the political radicals and so on, also didn't perceive. So you have this, you have this intrusion, not just into the society, but you have an intrusion into the very, the very kind of uh, uh, subjectivity of that Politi that political subjectivity and creativity of that society itself it's completely it's completely subverted expectations um and what wokeism has been very good at doing is basically uh withholding the real political subjectivity by framing itself as a, as a false political subjectivity um and 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 not only framing itself as a false political subjectivity because it's because it's an ideology which I don't agree with or something like that, but but because it literally frames political subjectivity by doing something very clever. And this is basically by saying, uh, you know, so for example, take this historically, uh, there was an intervention of, uh, there was a crisis with the financial crisis, there was um, COVID, there was this uh, geopolitical tensions with Russia, Every, everything's changed, everything is in crisis. Um, um, and what, what, what the kind of woke left has been very good at is saying, um, uh, is taking this energy of, um, uh, how do we say it? Like energy of, um, unexpectedness and energy of like, you know, uh, everything is upside down and the structures have been disrupted and there's a sort of, there's a sort of opportunity to rethink things and so forth. Um, taking that, that moment and saying, you know, like, you know, the instability of global capitalism, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, scientific and technological crisis with things like AI and biotechnics, which will require real philosophical thinking um, and will challenge the whole kind of liberal norms we live under, the uh, climate change even, um, uh, all of these things which are uh, changes in the geopolitical order, all these things sound very interesting and all. But, you know, what about bathrooms? Like, you know, sh like... What kind of signs should we put on the bathrooms, you know, to make everyone feel inclusive? Because this, this is an inclusive act, of course, you know. And and, uh, and uh, what kind of language should we use in our Zoom conferences? Um, <laughs> like, see what I mean? Like, it's um, uh, it's it's a distortion of the political uh, to suit the trivial. It's a distortion of the political to 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 um, reframe everyone's attention and reframe everyone's um, uh, energy towards the most trivial, the most stupid, the most inconsequential, and empowering by way the most impotent, and the most infantile, and the most incapable. <laughs> like, that's been the the benefit of wokeness and that's been the the uh, kind of a uh, kind of Foucauldian even sort of uh, social punishment of those who uh, uh, really were expecting something to happen with this historical opportunity and so forth and Zizek will say will say um 
okay, okay, but like what kind of blueprint do we want for uh, a society that's different to liberalism? No one has a blueprint. Okay, fair enough, right? But I, I don't really think that that's the way it works. I don't really think that the blueprint comes first. I think that the, the taking the situation, I think the situational awareness comes first. And the, the, the more kind of a practical uh, implementary changes and all that is sort of is, is, is secondary to that, it's consequential to that. And what, when he always says, okay, you know, look, these populists want this, want that, but, but what's the blueprint and so forth? I think he's obfuscating the question of um, uh, uh, the, the huge distinction between the politics of 100 years ago um, on the left, radicals really understood the opportunity. They, they, they had a they had a historical situational awareness, and and they really understood the uh, the sense in which crisis into in, into expectations um, creates the groundwork for for history. Whereas we don't understand that, or, or at least the left doesn't understand that. It 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 it, it thoroughly doesn't understand that. Um, which is why it's going to uh, it's it it tends to align itself with technocratic um, and managerial improvements of human beings because it just it just uses a pre-existing system and a pre-existing framework, apply exaggerates it and applies it to, to people and says let's make people better behave or something uh, by using you know social engineering or God forbid bio biotechnologies. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't see the intrusion as uh, a, a, a kind of moment, an almost like an almost like God given moment of uh, this is your fate. This is your this is your this, uh, this is your opportunity to rise to the occasion and so forth and and, and become that um that force of history as 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 Hegel said um you know seeing Napoleon uh, coming into. Uh, I think it was Germany, and he said, uh, this, this, this man is history. He's, he's history on horseback. Th this spirit of history, this spirit of rising to the occasion, um, of seeing the intrusion, seeing the upside, seeing everything being upside down and actually being able to make something out of that, this has been completely gone. Uh, this has been completely, this is, the left no longer has this. They no longer, they are no longer the guardians of this capacity, where to be fair to them, they used to be, you know. Um, that capacity i'm not saying that it th this group or that group has it now instead it's it's very unclear who has this <laughs> but like like we're not really sure who has this actually right and and that's the real political crisis it isn't that we don't have a blueprint for a new society it's that we don't know who has this this napoleonic capacity to turn the situation into something right it's like this, this creative um um kind of force of history and so forth it's it's a it's a problem to do at the end of history in many regards and i think commentators like zizek have not um uh, allowed themselves to accept this this their their preferred political demographics we'll say um uh are no longer the the guardians of this thing now that doesn't mean you have to support Trump or something. I, I don't think he is either, right? But uh, but but what Trump sort of symbolized, I think, was was the fact, at least, that the left no longer had this. Doesn't mean he has it, but the left certainly no longer has it. Which means not only is the throne empty in regards to in the obvious political sense, but the throne is empty in the in the who is the political subject in that sense as well like both thrones are empty now whereas a hundred years ago the only throne that was empty was the 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 obvious one right the uh, <laughs> the um the uh kind of obvious political authorities and so forth um the throne of subversion we could say is also empty so it's a kind of double it's a kind of double uh emptiness so the question is, like, I think, make a, make a bold prediction here. History now belongs to the people that can take that, that spirit of what I'm saying, turning the, turning the moment into a, turning the crisis into a, a creative moment, 
um, 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 this is this doesn't mean fetishizing crisis or hoping for crisis or something like that, right? Like um, uh, this just means this just means uh, um, seeing seeing the situation for what it is and sort of being able to respond to it. History now belongs to whoever can do that, and uh, there is a there is a Foucauldian punishment of of those who try because because we don't want to accept that the people we think have have this capacity no longer do and so forth but uh, i'm just sort of repeating myself now but um um what is this capacity you know like what is the nature of this capacity uh that i'm trying to very vaguely um hint to um there's a clip from peter slaughterdyke um and he, he 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 was asked about his book you must change your life um, which is sort of like a book about, uh, uh, it's, it's the most sophisticated self-help book you could probably ever get. It's not really a self-help book, right? It's, 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 it, we would roughly put it within that category of self-improvement. And I think the category of self-improvement is important because we have to understand these moments, not just as uh, opportunistic moments when, when, uh, more power can be gained in a kind of vulgar Machiavellian sense, um, uh, but also a moment of of his, of historical becoming. And you can take the word historical f to mean whatever you want. You don't need to make it. You don't. You don't need to assume the progressive understanding of that word. Um, but but to to see the situation as an opportunity, not just to take power or something vulgar like that, but also to to to. Um, um, to become greater in some fundamental sense. And this is not a exclusively leftist thing. Look at Nietzsche. Nietzsche is probably like the, the greatest example of this. God is dead and what happens within that crisis? Well, the Ubermensch emerges, right? This is not an exclusively, like we don't need to think of, you know, the kind of, the kind of, um, uh, the overcoming of crisis as something which is, uh, something which we frame in, in, a, in an assumed framework of, you know, uh, social progress or something like this. Like, there's lots of different ways we can, we can come with this from, and we should expand that category as much as we can. Um, but, but, so I'm going to play this clip from an interview with Peter Slaughterdyke and the interviewer, she asked him a very, very good question because his book is titled, You Must Change Your Life. And she kind of just says, um, okay, but like, what's this, where is this must coming from? Where is this this uh, this uh, imperative coming from? Um, um, you know, is it inside? Is it coming from outside? Is it coming from an authority? Is it coming from a friend? Is it coming from a, you know, who, where is this must coming from? A, a, a very good question. Uh, this answer, I think, is 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 great, and I think it 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 really explains the phenomenology of this um, kind of situational awareness. Um, so I'm, I'll, I'll 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 stop talking. I'll just play the clip now. So here you go. Yeah. And. Is that something that we that we really want then, that we desire maybe, or is it an ethical imperative? Uh, the 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 English title of one of your books is you you must change your life, so you must. Yeah. There there there's an imperative there. Uh, it doesn't seem to come from within, but without. Uh, why within? No? Why, why not within? <laughs> yeah, but uh, why without? Um, if people must, tell you, me I must do something... Because you think it is Moses who says... I don't want to, yeah. No, no but, but uh, consider a drowning man you know, in, a, in the sea. Uh, he hears an imperative. You must swim, mm. uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and this uh, swimming imper imperative uh, is is not uh, uh, the voice as uh, as no. as 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 as
It is uh, the situation itself uh, that comes to, to, to itself inside you. Yeah? We, 